When I was younger and started to know how drastically different I looked from everyone else, my father would say to me, Nati, it's not that you are missing any parts, it's more that we just can't see them. Existential crisis aside, my father was very clever in giving me ideas to pontificate. He would set the precedent for the rest of my life. It's not that I have any missing parts, it's more that you just can't see it. That single sentence would shape the backbone of my future aspiration. I wasn't told I couldn't do things. I mean, obviously, I couldn't do everything. And that was an essential equalizer to a necessary lesson. But more so, it posed the idea that I could try things and, yeah, maybe fail, but to not let those who would assume to be my deficits set the tone for my life. I was a precocious and animated child who was particularly aware of her unique surroundings, even to those that would illustrate their revulsion to, to me. After all, what's a gun without any bullets? My dad would tell me, if you, take the, if you get to the punchline before they, they do, then you take the salt out of insults, which I thought was very clever. <laughs> um, Something else he gave me, he never pulled any punches. He told me that no matter how smart, how intelligent, how clever I was, that it might not be enough for some people to look past. And for me, it was a defined, stubborn battle of mine, because I thought if they just talked to me, I could temper, I could temper their judgment. When I told them that I was looking into going into the hard sciences, he told me that I would probably have to work three times as hard to get to the same place. When I asked why, he said, well, for one, you're a woman, and fortunately there is no cure for that. <laughs> Two, because you're Latina, and three, because you are seen as disabled. Now, if I stood on a train platform or was in the grocery market in a line, you probably wouldn't think much of me, much less that I'd be able to string some coherent sentences together. And that's just the reality of our prejudgment. We are subjected to them, we give them more precedent than anything else because they help us rationalize our fears and, and the uncomfortableness of really our own insecurities. The defining line, however, is when it impedes our ability, or rather anyone's ability, to have a chance in the world. I am not here, I do want to clear something up, I am not here to tell you that if I can do it, you can do it. For the most part, our experiences are completely different, and I would not count my trials and tribulations to equal that of any of yours, because to do so is counterproductive and irresponsible and way too subjective. It would be like comparing apples to, say, hippopotamuses. I am here to tell you what the facts are. I am disabled by all defined parameters, but does that mean that I am also disqualified from existing in society simply because of that? This need to pigeonhole an entire group of people, borders on race, class, and gender, not just disability, and it's kind of ridiculous because it's often compounded by these factors. If you consider the already astounding statistics in the equality gaps in our nation, it's ridiculous to say the least. Even more so, the word disability insists upon perpetuating the ideas that we are incapable of sustaining our own livelihoods by any means, that we are at the mercy of those who choose to give us charity to allow us to be included in, in society. It does not adequately assert itself to distinguishable markers. For example, is my congenital disorder the same as someone with Down syndrome? No, absolutely not. Disability has no distinguishable markers. It does not distinguish between someone who is high functioning versus someone that suffers severe mental, physical, and intellectual disorders that are debilitating. Case in point, 
if I were to have a row of people and say, let's say one of them was blind or deaf, you probably wouldn't be able to tell which one because most deaf people, most blind people, most dyslexic people, they would pass under the guise of being normal. However, if you put me in a row of others who are similar, similarly intellectually similar to me, then I would be the odd man out. To be under the category of disability is not adequate to my capabilities, nor should any label be indicative to judge that capacity. Being smart has little to do with me being a woman, as much as many would like to argue the opposite. Equally, I do not count my intellectual growth to be inhibited by my anatomical deficits. In fact, I would argue that it has been an asset more than a hindrance. Our potential contributions should not be muted due to the arbitrary labels that we do not properly illustrate the realistic endurance that we are able to take on. We know our own limitations and we accommodate justifiably for them. We're more equipped to establish our own endurances because we know the scrutiny that goes along with our lives. Labels by themselves are not harmful. In fact, they exist to give us a means to sketch what things are and how to categorize them. But complex organisms such as people were much too complex for that. We are many things to many people. We exist on a daily basis, more in our jobs, in our schools, and in, in society in general. Our potential contributions should not be, not be muted due to arbitrary labels that do not properly illustrate the realistic endurances that we face. It is when a label becomes an association to something harmful and insulting to the point of impeding my aspiration. It's when it signifies my defeat as a human being because I am seen as weak and in need of charity. To feel as though I should be so lucky to have made it through an interview process, knowing that I'm probably not going to get the call back because of the inconvenience of the situation at hand. People are uncomfortable with it. If we do have any purpose, it's to show that we serve as a token, to show the mild diversity that this company is, in fact, diverse. Or, at the very least, to to shower their egos to make themselves feel better. And that's, that's not a life. I am at best tolerated, and no one should have to feel that way in any arenas of their lives. So if you take a look at this graph here, you'll notice that over 30% of people involved in science and engineering, most of them are men. And if you look down through this pie chart, you'll notice that it gets smaller and smaller pertaining to gender and race. Due to organizations like STEM, this number is actually growing, uh, albeit very, very slowly. There is some good news. According to the National Science Foundation, US citizens and permanent residents with disabilities earned a higher number of science and engineering doctorates in 2009 than they did in 1999. Since 2008, they have earned more doctorate in, in science and engineering fields than non-SME fields. And that number is continuing to grow as the years progress. Since the last decade, we have seen a small growth breaking the barrier of more people who are considered to have disabilities participating in highly competitive doctorate programs and successfully completing them. With that in mind, the last 15 years, we have seen a spike in people who are considered to have disabilities to not only earn a Bachelor of Science, but continue on to further their education. With these parameters, it is still less than 1%, but still growing. This number gives us hope, but they also signify something else. In 2014, why is this number so, so small? The employment of those that are sought after successfully completing their degrees are still significantly under. Something that I'd like to point out here, if you notice the men and women with disabilities, men still outcompete women, which signifies that it's not only the disability status, but also impedes in the gender gap. So that's something interesting I found. 
If this industry keeps hiring people that looks like them, nothing will ever change. Productivity will not decrease, but there's no real advancement to be made. If we are comfortable with who we hire, it does more of a liability because nobody is learning anything. Studies have shown that more diverse groups of people performing a common goal to accomplish. The more innovative, the more infused the product becomes to become something remarkable. You have people approaching the problem with different ideas than yours, different stories behind them. They approach it entirely different, which doesn't just make the project more remarkable, but it creates better employees because people are exposed to environments that they would not otherwise be exposed to, people that they wouldn't be exposed to. And that, that bleeds into every aspect of their lives. It doesn't just make them a better employee, it makes them a better person. And shouldn't we be in the business of making better people? People who are high functioning and have disabilities shouldn't be denigrated. If anything, the resourcefulness, resilience, and intelligence are all the more reason to hire them. Human experience has shown, has shown me that egos can get in the way of ourselves, often to our own bias that permeate into our abject observations. We are vulnerable to them. And that hinders our ability to fully ask the important questions. Why wouldn't any industry want to hire someone who has a natural propensity for innovation and adaptitude as opposed to not, when that's all we've been doing, making the world, making us fit into the world rather than having the world fit us. The greatest damage done to human beings are not bombs or nuclear warfare or even biological warfare. These exist purely as auxiliary vectors but rather something far more nefarious, our apathy towards those that do not look, look like us. We do ourselves a detriment by undervaluing, undervaluing a reservoir of untapped collateral. We no longer cultivate and include others that do not look like insert arbitrary category here, which will be our downfall. This extends far beyond disability, but can be applicable in gender, race, and class, and we see this by the numbers. If we keep hiring the same people to do these jobs, then nothing will ever really change, and we will fall, fall behind on the global scale. We as people need to be better than these numbers, but more importantly, we should, and we need to start now. If we are to do more than just survive, we don't need another age of enlightenment, but we do need an era of one, one that propagates thought and includes dignity and the idea that all ideas, all thoughts, all walks of life are welcome. The bravest thing to do is to go against the grain. And these next 20, 50, and so on years will be heavily relied on what we do now. We talk about being brave, but talk as little but waste time and energy that can be better spent in action. I am told that I am brave, and that's not true. I'm audacious. I'm not brave. I inflict myself onto the world like a virus, hoping to infect everyone I come in contact with. I think that it would be great if we lived in a society where bravery came second nature, where we could be audacious, where we could ask the questions and not be afraid of our social insecurities. I do so because I have a bit of arrogance in thinking that I have a right to be here. No, that I've earned a right to be here, that I could excel and compete in a world like this. Because all things are never equal, and for all the rejection I face, I'm not so much as brave as I am audacious. Because my stubborn nature depends, despite everything, I, can, I think I can change your mind. And now I'm asking you to be a little brave, to wager your personal comfort for something greater, and roll the dice 
and take a chance on someone, to allow yourself to be amazed by doing something as simple as opening a window. The thing that has kept me optimistic despite my better half is that I look to be surprised by people. I have seen the best and suffered the worst of folks that see me as a blight. And I love people for all that they are, but more for what they could be. And I live for the moment, for that door not to shut, but just to crack open long enough so that maybe, maybe you could see that I have all my parts. Thank you.